Ram and Dr. Nazir, very I'm very grateful for your invitation to talk about necrotizing enterocolitis, which remains a continuing enigma. Uh, you would have all, if not all, most of you would have attended or uh, heard Professor Joseph New at the Saudi Neonatal Society meeting, uh, his uh, review on necrotizing enterocolitis. Uh, I will give a much more pragmatic review, but at the very onset, at the very onset for my younger colleagues and perhaps even for the senior colleagues, I should say that NEC is a Gorak Thanda. It really is a very big Gorak Thanda. And that's what I will try and explain to you why uh, I have given the title that NEC is a Gorak Thanda. I have nothing to declare and there is no conflict of interest. Now, NEC is a devastating disease, particularly for the very fragile and very tiny preterm infants. Though we have known it for nearly 200 years, and for the last 60 years, we've been trying to find its etiology, define its pathophysiology, define it, necrotizing its enterocolysis itself. But despite all that, we haven't really made very great success, and we have not found any cure uh, so far with uh, all this work going on. But there is a lot of work still going on. So the objective of my talk is to discuss some newer concepts in our understanding of the NEC pathophysiology whilst keeping the talk clinically relevant, because I think that's the most important thing. Theory is important, but clinical relevance is important. So what I will do in this 45 minutes or so is to describe the scope of the problem, what NEC is and what it is not, and who is at high highest risk of developing NEC, but more importantly, I want to spend some time for my younger colleagues and maybe even for some of my senior colleagues to try and understand the changing uh, pathophysiology of necrotizing enterocolitis, particularly the role of gut microbiome, genetics, and immunology. And once uh, we finish that, then I'll talk about diagnostic clues, which we all know how to diagnose. Or we think we know how to diagnose an necrotizing enterocolitis. And once we diagnose it, how do we best manage it? And last, uh, in two slides of where the research is taking us, what is the direction of travel? So the scope of the problem is that it, NEC is a universal disease. It happens all over the world. The incidence in Europe is between 3 and 10 percent. In South America, between 8 and 11 percent. Much lower in Australasia, about 5 percent. But interestingly, if you see the figures I've given you, uh, about 6 or 7 percent in United in North America. But 20 to 30 percent of these babies die. It's the same number of babies who die as the same number of under 15 children who die from cancer plus meningitis. So NEC has a great uh, is a great killer of a new, a newborn babies, and that's a, that's important message to remember. The only study I could find from Pakistan is from Hashmi et al. Uh, in JPMA from uh, Aga Khan University Hospital, where they quoted an incidence of nine percent. Now I recognize before people jump on me that I've given you such high incidence. I know that many individual units have reduced the incidence of NEC. Our own unit, we had an incidence of 3%. But what is correct even today is that neonatologists all around the world still continue to overdiagnose and overtreat, in inverted commas, what they call NEC. And in just in the United States, each case of NEC costs around $500,000. And the overall cost of NEC in US is between 500 million to $1 billion. So it's a very, very expensive disease. Now, why is this so? Because you know, we as a neonatologist, if you get a baby with slight abdominal distension or increasing aspirates, we don't know what is going on, we're not sure. So let us, we label it as possible NEC and start treating it and as, as NEC. But of course, people forget that treatment involves nil by mouth, broad spectrum antibiotics, blood tests, and TPN, and all this costs money. Uh, and, and moreover, more than money, the role of antibiotic, it changes the gut microbiome, and that may have a lifelong effect. And recent papers have appeared where they have shown that changing the gut microbiome in the newborn period uh, has an effect on behavior and attitude uh, later in life. 
when we have nil by mouth, and we don't give enter any entrance stimulation. So there is continuing gut injury and the uh, gut integrity is continuing to be lost. Of course, we try and give as much nutrition as we can through TPN and whatever, but you will find that most of these babies go on to develop extra uterine growth restriction. So, and then that, that may affect them for all their life. So actually our overdiagnosis and overtreatment of NEC may be increasing the uh, morbidity while we're trying to treat what we perceive and, as NEC. So why is this so? The, there are two main reasons. One is most clinicians still have the conventional understanding of the pathophysiology of NEC, and I'll discuss that in the next slide. The second is there's a lack of clear definition of NEC. So what is the conventional pathophysiology concept? It is the concept of diving reflex. When you dive deep into the water or deep into the sea, as fishes do, you hold your breath, you get a bit hypoxic, and what happens is the diving reflex, the natural phenomena is to send blood to the brain and the heart and the liver, and the gut becomes ischemic because the blood is preferentially sent over to the brain and the heart. And if there is bacterial colonization at the same time and macronutrients, particularly from formula feeding, that is a recipe or that was considered to be the recipe for developing NEC. But of course, now we have got huge number of very variables, which are uh, this, uh, we now know may be responsible or contributing to the, towards the development of NEC. There are three things which are much the most important, and those are the three things I will stress on. One is the intestinal immaturity. Two is the excessive immunoreactivity of the intestinal mucosa. So once you have intestinal immaturity plus uh, excessive immunoreactivity to the bacteria in the gut or to the macronutrients in the gut, these three things combine to give you NEC. And as I said, there is a lack of precise definition. Here are seven babies I have put together there was, with their seven X-rays and they were all labeled as NEC. Only one has NEC. Can you tell which one? Rather difficult. And that is our problem. That is the problem why people lump all the, uh, all the abdominal distensions and, and ileus or uh, whatever they see in uh, radiologically and uh, label it as NEC. So we are over-diagnosing NEC. And interestingly, in literature, if you try and look for definition of NEC, there are about eight definitions. And Ravi Patel at a meeting, which was basically for uh, reviewing NEC, and there, this was United uh, US the neonatologists were attending it mainly, uh, who had interest in uh, necrotizing enterocolitis. And uh, Ravi did a, a small survey and asked them what class uh, definitions were they using. We surprised less than 5% were using the original Bell's classification or Bell's staging. Most were using the modified Bell staging, but the question is which modification? There are at least three modifications that I know of, but there are more. Not surprisingly, because it was a US meeting, only 2% were using the definition used in the United Kingdom. But only 20% were using the Vermont Oxford uh, network uh, definition of NEC. No one was using the CDC definition. And surgeons were much more keen to use what is called two out of three def uh, definition. And I will uh, show that to you in the next slide. Nobody was using the Stanford definition or the International Neonatal Consortium definition of NEC. But for me, what was most interesting is that 18% or so of these clinicians were using their own definition of NEC and not the eight already published in the literature. And that is where the, one of the difficulties is, uh, how do you diagnose NEC? So for this lecture, and for me, as I understand it, the definition of NEC is an idiopathic inflammatory bowel disease, mainly seen in premature infant that involves the small and the large intestine, but, and is characterized by cognitive necrosis. And that is the important factor that there should be cognitive necrosis. The problem is that how do you know there is cognitive necrosis unless you go and open up the abdomen and see the intestine? There should be inflammatory changes, bacterial overgrowth, 
pneumatosis intestinalis and perforation. So that is the basic descriptive uh, definition of NEC, which I'm going to use for this particular talk. And this is the one I use for clinical management. The two out of three rule, this, which Sheila Gephardt and uh, colleagues of, uh, of pediatric surgeons uh, suggest is that if two of these three things are present, pneumatosis intestinalis or portal gas, uh, gas diagnosis, persistent thrombocytopenia for three days or more, and postmenstrual age at disease onset more consistent with NEC, and we'll talk about that in a minute, then spontaneous intestinal perforation. So the major differential diagnosis really, where the surgeons want to differentiate, the physicians want to differentiate is between SIP, uh, the uh, spontaneous uh, intestinal perforation and NEC. And the way to do that is very difficult. Because the, in SIP, the fo there is a focal uh, rupture of the muscularis. There is no inflammation. There is some hypertrophy. There is no necrosis. Uh, the ileum is commonly affected. There is no inflammation. There is no evidence of spread of uh, infection. There is no ischemia. There is no nematosis. But even then, it is extremely difficult. And it occurs a little earlier than when you see NEC. And it is much more uh, less, uh, the mortality is much less. And if you ever grow an organism, you're likely to grow candida or staph epidermis. The risk factors are prenatal and postnatal, particularly if you have a, a chorioaminitis, preeclampsia, if there has been a knot in the, in the placenta uh, causing hypoxia, that would give you much more likely to give you a SIP rather than NEC. And of course, it is very closely related to the medications which we use frequently uh, in uh, neonatology. Now, the only saving grace, clinically it is very difficult. The only saving grace is a recent work and published by Son et al. in Nature only a couple of months ago where they have used machine learning. And machine learning tool can be applied and that can differentiate between SIP and NEC uh, very, very well uh, and quite clearly. So we are hoping that this tool will become universally available and we'll be able to differentiate between SIP and NEC. What other conditions uh, uh, masquerade or pretend to be NEC? Viral enterocolitis, usually associated with formula feeding. It is a lymphocytosis. It's also an immunological disease, but there is no necrosis and there is variable mucosal damage, not the universal damage which we see in NEC. The other is milk protein-associated uh, colitis, which is sensitivity to cow's milk protein, and this is due to eosinophilic recruitment in the mucosa. Now, you would remember from conditions like and uh, 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 other conditions where the granules of eosinophils are very toxic. And when the eosinophil ruptures, it causes, uh, it, it causes toxic damage to the mucosa by the eosinophil granules. That, debate about whether transfusion associated NEC exists or not exists, but it is thought to be due to presence of antigen to intestinal epithelial in the transfused blood. So if you have antigen to the epithelium of the gut of the newborn baby, then you would get uh, uh, transfusion associated uh, uh, neck, so, so, so to speak. But I'll tell you about that also in a, in a later slide. The most common reason why babies go on to develop NEC is because of delayed feeding or antibiotic associated because you, here, because of delayed feeding or giving antibiotics, you change the gut microbiome and you cause dysbiosis. That is the change in the gut, gut microbiome and you get exaggerated immunoreactivity. And I will spend some time explaining that to you, uh, what this means. And this causes, of course, ischemic damage to the gut. Then there is the other condition which probably is quite separate, and that is due to left-sided congenital heart disease causing hypoxic injury to the enterocytes because there is universal hypoxia. The enterocytes are hypoxic, and this leads to proliferation of bad bacteria, and this causes uh, E. colitis. So these are about five or six conditions which masquerade as NEC, and it's sometimes very difficult to differentiate between them. 
Who gets NEC? We all know that. This is a this is a slide from a textbook. Uh, you will know this. Uh, you can get this from any textbook, and I'm not going to go over it except to tell you that they are all interrelated. Uh, prenatal birth and postnatal, for example, uh, if the mother has a poor gut microbiome, if her, then she has much more uh, bad bacteria in her birth canal or in her in even in her <clears throat> that that is going to be transmitted to the baby and the ba baby is going to start with a great greater load of bad bacteria rather than good bacteria so it's all uh, interrelated with each other the question is when does the baby get nec the most frequent age gestation when babies you see nec is between something between 28 and 32 33 weeks there's a peak at around 31 32 weeks and this is when you see nec most often the problem is also and the very interesting issue is the age of diagnosis is inversely related to gestational age so the smaller the baby in the younger the gestation the later the nec is going to develop so if you have a 23 week or ba uh, 23 week baby that is going to take four to six weeks for NEC to develop whereas if you have a 29 week it's maybe two, two to three weeks whereas a term baby where NEC is un uh, infrequent but if they were to develop NEC then it takes a couple of days for them to develop NEC the question I want to ask you and to for you to think about is why is this so why do pre they get NEC much later, whereas nearer term or term, as you increase the uh, gestational term, the NEC appears uh, earlier and earlier. Because both of these babies, preterm baby or uh, near term baby, both of them have got uh, intestinal dysbiosis. There's a the, the bad bacteria has increased in number. The reason is that in preterm NEC is mainly due to immunoreactivity. So it's a mainly an immunological disease, whereas in the term infant or near term infant, it's mainly due to vascular reactivity. And so some people have actually said that the, the pre necrotizing enterocolitis in a preterm versus a necrotizing enterocolitis in a term baby are two separate diseases. And I'll try and explain that to you why that may um, be to some extent true. So let us try and understand the major players in the development of NEC. There are just four, not more, there are just four. Gut, the physical and chemical barrier, the gut offers uh, uh, to protect itself from the microbiome, the bad bacteria, the microbiome itself, gut immunology and genetics, and the gut intestinal blood flow. So those are the four reasons uh, which are the main players for uh, necrotizing enterocolitis, and I hope to discuss one by one with you. Let us start with the gut structure. The most important, one of the most important barriers is the mucus layer over the epithelial, uh, uh, epithelial lining of the gut. And this mucus layer is of two densities. The upper layer is thin, the layer below is thicker. And what it does is it protects or prevents the bacteria from getting in contact with the epithelial surface of the intestine. So the gut uh, mucus layer is extremely important. The second is these cells have to be bound to each other. The, epi uh, the epithelial cells need to be tightened to each other and they are bound with what is called the tight junctions. And the tight junctions start to develop from 25 to 26 weeks and then onwards. So the gut and uh, the cells become tighter and tighter uh, as the gestation in increases. And therefore the gut is a little leaky uh, to start off with in a 23, 24, 25 week. Then there is the goblet cell. The goblet cell has a major immunological function. It regulates the barriers. It regulates the gut integrity. But the most important cell in the gut, uh, as far as NEC is concerned, is the panet cell. It contains antimicrobial peptides, immunomodulators, and, that's a, and it impacts on what is in, uh, happening to the gut microbiome. What has been found on histology is that infants who go on to develop NEC have fewer panet cells. Now, one of the roles of the panet cells is to secrete uh, epidermal growth factor. That is the growth factor for the enterocytes, the uh, cells to grow, the so-called trefoil factor. 
And it, it also starts to increase from 26 weeks onwards. So again, the repair capacity of babies at 24, 25 weeks is not so good because the epidemic factor, growth factor is not that high. The epidemic growth factor decreases because it, it uh, increases the tightness and the growth of epithelial cells prevents the <clears throat> bacteria from going into the circulation or translocating through the uh, through the uh, epithelial cells of the gut. Excuse me. The second is the microbiome itself. We all know that for you and me, the gut microbiome are extremely important for our good health. If it changes to more bad bacteria, we suffer from disease too. And so what happens, what do good bacteria do? They strengthen the gut, they tighten the uh, uh, tight junctions, they produce metabolites like arginine, glutamine, and short-chain fatty acids that protect the enterocyte from damage and injury, and they dampen down the immunoreactivity immuno in the gut, as I will show you in the next couple of slides. They also have a much greater binding affinity uh, with uh, secretory IgA. If bad bacteria become preponderant, they become more, this is so-called dysbiosis, all this is reversed. You have the tight junctions become loose, the bacteria can uh, translocate very easily and uh, in, uh, into circulation, and that causes damage uh, to not only the gut, but also the endothelial cells of the intestine. And this has been shown beautifully by one of my previous tra trainees, Pami Mohan, uh, who is now a professor at, at Baylor. And he showed that prior to development of NEC, there is a change in the gut microbiome. It occurs in a suddenly, and just like a flower blooms, the sudden bloom of the bad bacteria, the protobacterium from being in minority becomes the majority. And so you, what you have uh, in NEC is that there is much more bad bacteria than good bacteria. And that I think is very important to remember that this, this biosis is taking place uh, at the time when we are diagnosing or treating NEC. But the bad microbiome are not just simply in the gut. They have a very close relationship with the, uh, with the brain, so-called gumba, the gut, uh, uh, gut um, microbiome brain axis. And what that is, because it, the gut microbiome has an impact on what is happening to your neuronal, uh, neuronal growth and to your <clears throat> um, brain uh, growth. And you will see that uh, this has been shown that surgical NEC, if you have surgical NEC, it increases the risk of an, a cerebral palsy. It, re, it increases the risk of mental development impairment, uh, physical de uh, uh, development impairment, and neurological de uh, de development impairment. So. The change in the microbiome uh, is a, an extremely unhealthy thing to have. And so, unfortunately, this is what happens in NEC. Coming to genetics, yes, there are some babies are genetically predisposed uh, to developing NEC. Babies who have a, pre, uh, who are, uh, have a significantly higher IL-18, IL 6 or 7 AA genotype these are the babies who go on to develop uh, stage three uh, NEC, significant or serious NEC. Some babies uh, also genetically have less IL-4 receptor gene. The IL-4 receptor gene is a protector gene. It prevent, uh, protects the gut from injury. And by converting uh, and producing more Th2 helper cells, uh, and those you know, to help ourselves protect against the development of NEC. So if you have a combination of IL-18 AA genotype plus the deficiency of IL-4 receptor gene, then you are much more likely uh, to develop NEC. And these, this can be studied and you can predict which baby is likely to develop NEC if you do uh, study the genetic markers. But what I want to concentrate and what is important uh, more uh, because it gives you a greater understanding of how NEC develops. So the immunology of NEC, there is altered um, or dysbiosis, 
There's maybe antibiotic therapy, nil by mouth, but it increases the bacterial, bad bacterial activity, which signals, uh, sends signals down. And then because in, uh, 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 accompanying the immature intestinal barrier, which I have discussed earlier, along with uh, the exaggerated uh, presence of elevated expression of TLR, toll light re receptor 4, which is important for gut development and injury. And this TLR4 then um, increases and causes exaggerated inflammatory and tissue injury, leading to intestinal necrosis and necrotizing enterocolitis. For some of my younger colleagues, who may not know what toll-like receptor 4 is. Toll-like receptor is a receptor of the pattern recognition family. So whenever you and I get an infection or a foreign bacteria or a foreign antigen, our body uh, has got uh, uh, pattern recognition um, uh, molecules which recognize that and then try and block it. And this is a signaling receptor that is necessary for hemostasis of many epithelial cells, whether be it in the gut or the urethra or the vaginal canal or in the lungs. Now, what happens is that you have uh, these uh, bacteria releasing toxins. They are interacting with TLR. TLR then signals and causes a calming sequence. It has two actions. It is polymorphic. So it causes hemostasis. It balances the hemostasis. And it, it also causes uh, repair if there, is, there has been any injury. But if there is unchecked TLR uh, release, there's, a TLR, there's too much TLR, then there's loss of this balance. And the loss of this balance causes increased injury and poor repair. Now, that is OK. Why does it happen in the preterm infant much more than in the term infant or any other infant? The answer is very simple. The TLR development starts at around 20 weeks and reaches a peak at around 34 weeks. And when the TLR is increasing, that is the time when you uh, get necrotizing enterocolitis most often. So that is the reason why you get uh, necrotizing enterocolitis much more so in babies born between 25 and 31 or 32 weeks of gestation. So that gives you an explanation, an immunological explanation, why we see NEC when we see it. Now, what does TLR actually do uh, physically and chemically? It interacts uh, with the premature gut and uh, the abnormal uh, microbiota. It then causes damage because of uh, it is uh, hyperactivity. It has it is very active. It is higher in, uh, in amount and it is uh, highly immunoreactive. It causes damage to the uh, to the mucous layer and uh, to the muc um, uh, epithelial layer. And then this uh, increase it also affects the uh, endothelium of the uh, of the blood vessel uh, gut blood vessels, particularly the uh, capillaries and the mesenteric blood vessels. Because TLR4 suppresses the release of endogenous uh, nitric oxide, nitric oxide, as you know, is a vasodilator. When you suppress that, you get vasoconstriction. So the mesenteric blood vessels constrict and there is lack of blood supply to the, uh, to the gut and ischemia, and this cycle keeps on going. And that is the reason why you have a progression towards necrosis. Uh, and the preterm infant ha has not got the ability to down-regulate TLR4. So as far as term infant is concerned, because the TLR has reached its stop and is coming down, has got the ability to reduce the TLR, uh, TLR uh, upregulation, but preterm infants do not. And that is the, one of the reasons why preterm infants get much more severe NEC. <clears throat> so to summarize the TLR polymorphism, if there are stressors which increase the, uh, increase the TLR and, and lead to necrotizing enterocolitis through the Th2 uh, lymphocytes, which I talked about, and there are protectors. So if you have more uh, stressors, you will get necrotizing enterocolitis. If you have more protectors, you will not get necrotizing enterocolitis. So it is important to try and get the TLR down uh, to normal levels and to have an equal balance so that there is a uh, the, TL, the right amount of TLR is available for repair of the gut rather than in injury to the gut. 
one last science, and then we will finish science, I promise you, and that is the uh, uh, IL-22 in the gut. IL-22 is also uh, very important because it is, it, it is present in the mucus layer, it is present at the epithelial <clears throat> margins, and it is, it is lacking in, pre in premature infants. The, that is not what is important why I want to discuss this, but the importance I want to discuss this is that the recombinant IL-22 has been found. If you give that to mice, it protects the mice from developing necrotizing enterocolitis. Mahi et al. showed this last year. What they did was to give a recombinant IL-22, and you find that the tight junctions become tighter, the cellular epithelial damage becomes less, there is epithelial regeneration and the inflammation is down. So that is another new uh, modality which may become available uh, for human experiments and for human use much later, uh, later uh, in coming years. Last but not least, but this has nothing to do with immunology. This is to see, show you the difference between uh, term NEC and preterm NEC. In term and near term infants, it is the failure of the compensatory autoregulatory mechanism, the diving reflex, which I uh, discussed earlier, to preserve the intestinal blood flow secondary to hypoxia, ischemia. And so there is hypoxia and ischemia in the gut, in the gut of uh, the term or near term infant, and that is what gives them NEC. Whereas on a preterm infant, the arterioles fail to dilate because of suppression of endogenous nitric oxide uh, on the influence of the TLR. And also uh, in the developing uh, um, blood, uh, um, blood vessels in the, in the mesentery, the submucosal vessels in the preterm infants with NEC have a higher concentration of endothelin-1, which is a vasoconstrictor. So they have much more vasoconstrictor, and they also, uh, and the TLR is suppressing the vasodilator. That's why they get much more high, uh, ischemia and much more serious injury to the gut. And this is what we see, uh, and this is what we subconsciously believe in. And therefore, they, when there is absent or uh, uh, reversed end diastolic blood flow, we stop feeding or do not feed these babies. But it is less common in very preterm babies. But the clinical uh, practice is strong, but the scientific evidence is very soft. In fact, the meta-analysis does not show that it makes any difference whether you feed them or you don't feed them, or when you have umbilical catheters, whether you feed them or you, or you don't feed them. But what does make a difference is giving antibiotics. If you give antibiotics, you start changing the bacteria and the microbiome in the gut very early, as early as 48, within 48 hours. So even when we talk about empirical uh, antibiotic, ther antibiotic therapy, uh, and that it, it does not cause any problems, it does because it changes the gut mucosa and there is, it makes the bad bacteria uh, more predominant. Interestingly, there was a study from China uh, two years ago, which is fascinating, which I don't understand, which most people don't understand, and most people don't really believe it, is that they actually showed that anti giving antibiotics was protective against necrotizing enterocolitis. This has to be repeated. This is a very controversial study, but I just wanted to put, put it there so that any the seniors amongst you, Dr. Nasser and Dr. Junaid, uh, who are always very uh, uh, very astute in pointing out these things may, um, may um, say that I did not show this particular study. Now, I uh, said I mentioned a little bit about the blood transfusion related uh, necrotizing enterocolitis. The meta analysis, earlier meta analysis, showed that, that was a, there was a relationship between transfusion and necrotizing enterocolitis. But again, Ravi Patel's work has shown that it is not the transfusion, but it is the anemia. If you let the babies become anemic, then they are much more likely to get NEC. So if you don't, and a, a paper has been just published. Uh, I think uh, this month or last month in archives, uh, giving values when you should and when you should not transfuse a baby. Just as a sideline, I just because I found it very interesting, transfusion. If the transfused blood is coming from female donors, 
particularly elderly female donors, that is much more safer and much more protective of NEC than uh, transfusion and the bl transfused blood coming from male donors. I don't, uh, I don't understand why this is so, but this is a, a, a recent meta-analysis which has been published, which is rather interesting uh, concept. So let us finish with science and summarize what happens in NEC. You have dysbiosis, predominantly unfriendly bacteria that break the blood and the gut barrier, and then that releases, increases TLR, uh, uh, TLR uh, signaling, and which causes activation of cytokine, apoptosis, breakdown, and brown, uh, bacterial translocation, which leads to the endothelial vasoconstriction and uh, continuing cycle, which causes intestinal ischemia and necrotizing enterocolitis. You can stop all this if you want to, giving breast milk, pro, uh, some people say by, also by probiotics, but of course with TLR inhibitors. Clinical signs and symptoms, often NEC comes as a surprise. The baby is doing well and suddenly uh, you find that the baby is popping uh, up uh, a big abdomen and the baby is very, very unwell. But we all know, we all know the signs and symptoms uh, of necrotizing enterocolitis or diseases which mimic necrotizing enterocolitis, poor intolerance, abdominal distension, blood in the stools, thrombocytopenia, uh, ileus, or whatever. But interestingly, some people have started looking at when these signs appear. If you look at the 50% rate, the, the earliest sign in the 25, 24 week babies uh, have, is intramural gas. The, in babies who are much older, it takes much longer and the portal venous gas appears much later. But what is important, as, as it is important in late onset sepsis, is the change in heart rate variability. And that has been shown recently to be a much greater predictor of developing NEC. And that is something if you have a heart, a heart rate or HERO monitor, then you will be able to use that. Those people who do not have, and um, People have started looking at what other methods can we have to diagnose or predict NEC. The heart rate and saturation I've talked about, which was by Fairchild. There is a scoring system based on baby's behavior, cardiorespiratory and abdominal findings by Jenny Fox. And there is a nursing tool based, by, uh, based on gestation and feeds and risk factors. But the most frequently and more Get with a tool which is getting more popular is so-called gut check NEC. It has nine risk factors and it has uh, it evaluates on, uh, the risk uh, based on those nine factors and it has some credibility and I think uh, people need uh, more studies need to be done before it becomes universally available. What for us who do not have those tools, the four tests which are important. Uh, thrombocytopenia, sensitive but not specific, uh, uh, the intestinal fatty acid binding protein, sensitive and high, highly specific, IL-6 and IL-8, sensitive but low specificity, uh, uh, the calper protein, high specificity, low sensitivity, and uh, salivary EGF, high sensitivity and high specificity. And here is a study showing the uh, thrombocytopenia is persistent, whether you have surgical, medical NEC or surgical NEC. If you look at calcium protein, specificity is high, but the sensitivity is low, but it has a high predictive, positive predictive value. And intestinal fatty acid binding protein increases with NEC as NEC develops. We normally use radiology. Unfortunately, the sensitivity and specificity is only about 40%. And to my surprise, reading the literature, about 35 to 40% of perforations are missed on a plain radiology. Ultrasound is gaining uh, uh, importance and is very good technique, but it is operator dependent. And if the operator is good, you can make the diagnosis very easily. But if they are learning, it is a learning curve. And once you learn the technique, then it is easy to diagnose. What about using classification and staging NEC? There have been at least, as I said, Bell's classification, the original one, which was focused on clinical staging, modified Bell's, there are three at least. And the idea was to have a clean data set uh, of other conditions versus NEC. Then there's Gordon's classification, which basically tried to separate NEC from SIP. 
And then there is the acquired neonatal intestinal diseases uh, classification, which focuses on risk factors. So there are many classifications which are used. I personally have suggested this in uh, 2016 in our paper, simplified it very simply, suspected NEC, medical NEC, surgical NEC, and you can read the details about this and the study on this in our, in our, in our paper. So coming to final closing sessions of this talk, what are the treatment modalities? And this has not changed since the 1960s. So, uh, since I started doing neonatology in 1965, uh, uh, so, uh, sorry, 1968, uh, it, this has not changed. The idea is to normalize the hemodynamic rearrangement. If there is a baby in shock, you need to treat that, minimize the progression of disease, removal of dead intestine. But how do we do that? Resting the gut. So we don't, we stop feeding to stop minimize bacterial translocation. The question is for how long? Nobody knows. Most people do it for 10 days. Some people do it for seven days. Some people like us, we do it for, we were doing it for five days. Reduction of infection, starting antibiotics. Okay, which antibiotics? For how long should we give antibiotics? Should we be adding antifungals to these uh, to, to our management regime? Don't know the answer. Removal of necrotic gut, should we drain or should we do laparotomy? Once again, no, don't know the answer to that. But what we do know is that human milk reduces inflammation and repairs intestinal injury. Hence, human milk feeding should be initiated as early as possible. Question about pro use of probiotics and lactoferrin is debatable, and there are new anti-inflammatory and amniotic fluid and stem cell therapies. And let's go through one of them quickly, the resting the gut. Now, I showed you in my enter feeding talk that resting the gut is, if you, if you don't feed, you, you promote a villous atrophy, you promote dysbiosis. So feeding is good, but of course, in necrotizing enterocolitis, <coughs> we are between the devil and the deep sea. What do we do, whether we should feed or we should not feed? Most people will opt not to feed. And, but very importantly, as again, I pointed out in my entrance uh, nutrition talk, the introduction of a standardized feeding regimen, but early from Australia has shown that they were able to reduce the risk of NEC by 87%. So no matter what you do, ladies and gentlemen, do have a standardized feeding regimen. Breast milk, breast milk, breast milk. Uh, there is loads of meta-analysis showing exclusive breast milk is protective against NEC. Even partial breast milk is protective against NEC. For every 10% increase in formula milk, there is a 12% increase in NEC, 20% increase in surgical NEC, and about 18% increase in, uh, in late onset sepsis or sepsis. Now, there are those reasons, there are many, many other, but the main immunological reasons why human milk is protective is because human milk uh, dampens down the TLR, which I have talked about. It has more secretory IgA. It has uh, lactoferrin, which uh, covers uh, the mucosa and protects the bacteria coming in contact with the epithelium and the presence of oligosaccharides. Now, we'll discuss that in just one second because I think that's very important. The human oligosaccharides are unique to humans. They are not found in animals. They, some uh, uh, vegetables have them, but these are unique to humans. And not only unique to humans, they are unique to mother and baby dyad. So the, the oligosaccharides for one, from one mother to her baby are uh, combined, whereas they, to another mother, it may not be useful. But what are these? These form about 13% uh, of the solid component of breast milk. Uh, there are about 200 of them. They are not digested and provide no energy, but are necessary for gut integrity and controlling intestinal immunoreactivity and growth of good bacteria. And I said, they are influenced by the genetics and the mother and infant diet. But what is most interesting, what is most interesting is the recent finding that a particular uh, oligosaccharide, the so-called diacetyl uh, tetros, DSLNT as it is called, is much lower in babies who go on to develop NEC and uh, certainly even lower in babies who go on to develop stage three NEC as compared to stage two and, as com and, and babies who do, do not develop NEC. So herein lies a dilemma. How do we get 
and, and DSL and T into the baby. If you use donor milk, the donor milk comes from mature uh, mothers who have delivered uh, much full term babies. And they, in them, the oligosaccharide levels are much lower, as I showed you in my previous talk. So we need to use preterm milk, uh, uh, human milk, to feed these babies. Or if we can isolate this particular oligosaccharide and try and see if we can add this uh, to the milk, uh, whether it will be protective or not. Here is another uh, likely progression where uh, research will take us into uh, protecting NEC. We always, all of us, and do TPN initially when we diagnosed necrotizing enterocolitis. As I said, how long do we do TPN for? When do we start enterofeeding? When do we start trophic feeding? Don't know. As I said, seven to 10 days is the traditional way. We did it at five days, but I don't, I don't have evidence to say that our way was better than or worse than any. But the dilemma of TPN is, of course, if you don't have uh, anything going in the gut, the bacteria find it easy to translocate through the epithelium. What about probiotics? There have been large 56 studies and 30 observational studies. Nearly 87,000 babies have been studied. The usage is very variable. And it's for, the highest use is in Europe and the lowest use is in South America, of course, because of cost. But it's also uh, not used very much in the in North American continent. It is uh, used quite a lot in Australasia. I just got this figure from the Middle East. Um, it, I think they are starting to use probiotics uh, gradually. Probiotics uh, are very useful. They decrease adhesion, they increase tight junctions, they increase IgA, they kill pathogenic bacteria, and they dampen inflammatory response. So there is some evidence uh, to support the use of uh, the probiotics. And the last uh, meta-analysis by Sharif showed that if you use lactobacillus uh, plus bifidobacter, it reduces NEC and it reduces mortality. If you use just lactobacillus, then it reduces NEC, but not mortality. And this is from the European Consortium, where before the era of starting probiotics, the NEC rate was this. Once they started routinely using probiotics, the rate fell. And this is true for babies under 25 weeks and babies between 25 and 30, 26 weeks. However, important questions regarding the appropriate timing, duration, optimal strain, and long-term outcome remain. To treat, if you use probiotic to prevent a level two, a stage two or three NEC, you need somewhere between 29 and 60 babies. Lactoferrin, as I said, uh, is a very great immunoprotector of the gut, and human lactoferrin has been shown to be of benefit. Bovine lactoferrin has not been shown to be of benefit. So lactoferrin, possibly one can use or not. Now, this debate about surgery, whether to give, uh, do uh, a, a drain or laparotomy, as you can see, the figures from the United States to 2017, the, uh, the surgical, uh, surgical NEC, uh, surgical NEC uh, is about the same, at, uh, whereas the medical NEC has come down. But mortality from surgical NEC has remained between 20 and 30 percent, 30, 35 percent, whereas mortality from medical NEC is between 15 and 20 percent. Whether to drain or do laparotomy, when I was as an associate professor at Sick Kids in Toronto in 84, 85, the chief of surgery, uh, Edmund Ein, uh, started putting drains in. And at that time, the drains were, uh, drains were not very, uh, very popular, but drains have started becoming popular. And in 2017, in fact, uh, there is more drain than laparotomy. And in the two, 2021 last, Last year, this is from Blakely, American figures, there's hardly any difference uh, between doing laparotomy or putting a drain in first. The surgeon, it depends entirely on the surgical and surgeon's team. A very small study from UC Davis by has shown that each uh, NDI then, uh, but this study is very, very small of only 94 babies. 
We all know the complications, abscess formation, short gut neurodevelopmental delay. And one thing I want to point out, if you have a very preterm baby and you do surgery early, the recurrence is possible because the, if you do it in the time period when the TLR is still rising, you, will, you are likely that you may get recurrence. And so don't be surprised if you do surgery, surgery very early on in very preterm babies that you get recurrent NEC. Long-term complications, high morbidity is high, uh, much more so in surgical NEC than in medical NEC. So my friends, at the end of all this, the clinical diagnosis is unclear, clinical marker of NEC, and the treatment has remained unchanged from the 60s. So it is a little surprise or a little wonder that we as clinicians overdiagnose and overtreat NEC. And that is going to happen till we get more accurate diagnostic tests, until our therapies are much more individualized to uh, treat NEC. How about preventive? Uh, uh, you need a large number of babies, each prevention strategy, whichever one you take, except these two, but these are based on very, very tiny babies. So prevention strategies essentially is really, is trying to avoid, uh, uh, avoid formula milk, trying to avoid stress, trying to avoid hypoxia, uh, uh, and trying to avoid uh, the immunoreactivity and dampen that down. And this has been done uh, at Amro University, and that is the best approach I think, and I can recommend that, is to do a quality improvement approach. And they have been able to decrease their incidence, base incidence from 8% down to 4% by doing uh, quality improvement. And what they did was they reduced their time duration uh, of indwelling feeding catheters. They moved on to as quickly as possible to use cup and spoon. They provided pro probiotics. They provided placental transfusion, i.e. delayed clamp co uh, follow it. They increased the um, use of human milk and if there were donor or human uh, fortification and they reduced totally zero the acid suppression. I think acid suppression drugs are nobody uses them anymore. But the QI is the way to go forward at this particular moment in individual unit because research to uh, research results will take some years to come. So to summarize, if we can prevent prematurity, good early and exclusive use of breastfeeding, standardized feeding policy, consider use of probiotics, appropriate and as short as possible use of antibiotics. Make sure that there's enough arginine in your TPN because it's a uh, enterocyte uh, protector agents to uh, reduce enterocyte death, that is TLR, but these are experimental and surgery debate we, uh, whether we to do uh, drain or uh, surgery. Last two slides and I finish, I promise you, we have been late in recognizing that we recognize that maternal milk and colostrum protects against NEC, but we have been late in recognizing that babies in utero do not get NEC. Why do they not get NEC? Because the amniotic fluid contains very similar um, uh, things that we have in, in human milk and in colostrum. And that's the, the current uh, research going on showing that amniotic fluid swallowed by the developing fetus inhibits TLR. So it re reduces immunoreactivity and therefore and increases the gro uh, epidermal growth factor and therefore heals the gut much more easily and prevents it from uh, developing NEC. Last but not least, this, there are two interesting studies which I found interesting. One is a polymer use of polymer called Haloran, which if you give it to the baby, it causes it forms a layer uh, just like a mucinous layer and it prevents translocation. Uh, and so that has been tried uh, in animals and has shown good results. The other was a study from Italy, which I found fascinating, but don't understand it fully, but I need to review the literature more. Uh, just about to finish there. Uh, is that, uh, this is called remote ischemic conditioning, RIC. What they do is they have a, 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 a sphygmometer and cause ischemia of the limb, uh, upper limb for 30 seconds to 60 seconds uh, repeatedly from time to time. And what they have shown is that during the period when the ischemia 
atmosphere, there is much more blood supply to the gut, and therefore they have been they have shown that it reduces the incidence of necrotizing and coprolysis. I just found it fascinating. That's why I have put it. But I think the way forward is to find epidermal growth factor and human oligosaccharides, and to for diagnosis is machine learning. So at the end. My friends, despite 60 years of NEC experience, lack of improvement, overall survival remains because due to lack of definition, specific diagnostic uh, modalities, inexact and non-personalized treatment, and the bottom line remains in trying to control TLR and preventing death from of the enterocyte. I'd like to thank you for your attention, and I'm sorry if I have, I have no, I have not gone over time. I'm on time, so I'm ready for any questions. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, sir. Uh, so moving towards the questions. So a few questions are here. Uh, yes. The one is, uh, what is role of uh, metronidazole in the neck, NEC? Uh, it's very debatable. Majority of <clears throat> majority of babies who get NEC, the uh, culture positivity rate and certainly anaerobic bacteria <laughs> rate is very low. So uh, we, when we started, <clears throat> excuse me, in the, <clears throat> in the 60s and 70s, we used to use flagell uh, metronidazole routinely, but we gave it up a long time ago. We don't routinely use it. Oh, sir, so, so I think. Uh, it is more uh, because of the anaerobic to uh, cover, and especially if they have a pneumatosis or the uh, perforation. Uh, uh, question, um, question, Janet, you're absolutely right. But, uh, but actually, the finding of anaerobic bacteria is very low uh, in mm -hmm. NEC, whether they, even when after perforation, if you look at yeah. the drain flow, it comes out, it is very low. And so the use of Metronidazole is debate, as I said, debatable. Some people use it. We we yeah. gave it up a long time ago. <clears throat> oh, right, sir. <laughs> do, do you use it? Do you use it, Janet? Do you use it? No, we use uh, the actually we uh, actually we are covering the anaerobes, but uh, through uh, other uh, antibiotics like uh, 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 tazobactam, piptaz, you know. So we are but, not. So you, you, so you, 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 do you use as a bactam routinely in NEC? No, no, no. And no, uh, Navid, no. uh, Navid, what do you do? Oh, Navid is not there. Uh, I, am I, not I saw his. Yeah. Don't worry. I'm just asking what people do. As I said, we don't, we don't use it. Yeah. We don't use routinely, but we see the very severity and the inflammatory yeah. markers and all those, then we use. Some yeah, maybe, maybe that, and, and other reasons to use it, but routinely we don't use it. Yeah, so routinely. In spite of culture negative? Sorry? In spite of culture negative? There, yeah. No, majority of the time it is culture negative. It is very negative. difficult to get culture positive. Right. So, so second question is, uh, can... NEC occurs uh, in first week of life in preterm babies? Rare, very rare. As I showed you, the reason for NEC in very preterm babies depends on how preterm the baby is. The, if, the, if you're talking about a baby at 34, 35 weeks, then yes, it can occur in the first week. But if you're talking about really preterm babies less than 33 weeks, then it usually takes a week or two or longer. Right, sir. Uh, so the third question is, uh, can we use probiotic to prevent the NEC? Well, as I gave, as I showed you, some people are using it in North America. Still, they are they are reluctant to use it. But even but Emory University and others are using it. It is used in Europe. I am trained a, a European trained neonatologist and practice in Europe. So I uh, have been using probiotic. But again, the, we don't know what which probiotic you're going to use, how long you're yeah. going to use, when are you going to start, and uh, and what strains should there be in, in your preparations. And of course, remember that mo most of the preparations are commercial preparations and not yes. made for uh, medical use. So they, it may have, and there have been uh, infections uh, secondary to probiotic therapy. So probiotic is not that simple. Yeah, right. and just to add, Saeed, one minute. Uh, yeah. Inshallah, uh, on 
I think uh, Monday is starting Tuesday. They are going to uh, present the latest data. If you know Dr. Richard Chandler in hot topics about probiotics. So inshallah, we will update you. Right, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, so moving to, towards next question. Next question. Uh, can donor milk uh, cause any C? Can what? Uh, donor, donor milk. milk. Can donor milk uh, cause NEC? No, no, no. Milk is protect. Human milk is protected. What I said was that donor milk, because it is coming from mothers who actually deliver at term, has got yeah. less oligosaccharides than the, than the preterm milk com coming from pre mothers who have delivered preterm. So uh, it is protective. But if you have uh, a milk from a preterm mother, it is uh, it has much higher oligosaccharide levels and it's much more protective. Right. Uh, wait, one minute, say uh, because I don't forget. Uh, sir, you said that the animals don't have HMOs. Uh, the 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 specificity Animal of milk. that's correct. That's correct. The vegetables have uh, some related NEC uh, oligosaccharides, but human milk oligosaccharides are unique to humans. Yes. So so. Uh, you you know now all the formula companies uh, adding the HMOs and they, this is the labor, laboratory make uh, HMOs. So what do you think about those HMOs? Um, the evidence so far is that it, uh, this is just a, a ploy. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Go ahead, Said. Okay, sir. Uh, sir, moving towards the end of the question. Uh, uh, any role of uh, omiprazole in NEC? Uh, no. Any role of? Uh, any role of? Any role uh, of what, Janine? Uh, Omiprazole. In NEC. Uh, PPI, mm -hmm. proton pump inhibitors. Yes. Not at all. Not at all. Not at all, yeah. Right, sir. Uh, so Dr. Navi. Sajjad had, had, had raised his hand. Anyway, uh, go ahead. Go ahead, Saeed. Please go ahead. Please go ahead. <clears throat> so another question. Uh, Asha, Dr. Nabeed comment is, we use uh, metronidazole. Uh, our surgeon uh, love it. Well, the surgeons love yeah. the surgeons love many things, but we, we are not quite sure that we, 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 it, love, yeah. we love it that much. <laughs> and, and you know, that, that, that practice is also very old, that seven days NPO and continue antibiotic for seven days. You yeah. know, so, so you if you have a feeding intolerance and let's say whatever the stages or whatever the grading you are using, the grade one or stage one and you see, just put them in an NPO, relax the gut. That's more than enough. You don't have to start antibiotic unless until other parameters are okay. Indeed. Right. I mean, and that also, the, the, the longer you leave the NPO, the bad it is. Exactly. The this is, but the, this makes the nurses and everybody so anxious. So yes, we uh, usually do three days to five days, and yeah. then we will see. Yeah. We have done it. We have done it for five days for many many years, and uh, sure, uh, we sure. start with feeding after that. Exactly. Hello. Can you listen to me? Yes, I can. Yeah, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity. Uh, it was an excellent uh, uh, review of the subject. And I'm just requesting you if you can kindly put it as a review article. And okay. we'll be happy <laughs> to publish it in the Journal of Clinical Neonatology. Okay, I will do this that. This will be very good for the profession in, in large. And we had a similar presentation in the Saudi Neonatal Conference, two presentations. And I, I, did, I did mention was, that. I yes, did mention course, that, yeah. Joseph knew, yes. Yeah. And one of them was about the diagnosis using the ultrasound, which is, of course, it is, it's a new area which we all need to uh, learn. As the I said, second, uh, ultrasound is very good, but it is operator dependent. And of so, course, we, we need yeah. training. Yeah. That's the basic bottom line. Now, the other issue is about the this machine diagnosis. Can you yes. explain this a little bit more to, to right. understand? Yes. What what they do is what is being done. What is done is that you take a large database, 
from many, 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 many units. For example, if you take the database from all the women, uh, when Oxford uh, network database uh, of cases of NEC, you then uh, write down and I, I, all the all the variables which you can think of, and then you try and uh, analyze each variable uh, in relation to development of NEC. Uh, only a machine can do that. And once that is done, you will then find that a machine can, uh, can actually narrow it down to five, four or five things. And that uh, will then be able, and that machine, if you put those four or five things, that will give you whether the diagnosis is NEC or, or SIP or something else. I think so. What uh, exact Joseph data you, this machine uh, needs? Oh, hundreds, hundreds of data. Um, <laughs> actually, I can send you uh, Sajad a paper on that because the, the data collection is massive, massive, and then the companies are uh, are spending millions uh, collecting data from uh, thousands of units to because it has to be validated. It has to be very machine. Can learn uh, once you feed it something like thousands and thousands of data uh, data points. It then analyzes that. <clears throat> but then that is not uh, something useful for individual patient care. Not at the moment. But once they once they, uh, they once they get down, for example, the different some uh, paper in Nature uh, this this year, they have been uh, down to only five things so you can actually uh, neck and sip uh, so it will become uh, it will come in greater use so, uh, over time at this moment in time it is just a research tool yeah thank you very much and that's the last thing is that the two or three beautiful slides which you showed about the role of breast milk in reducing the incidence of NEC can you kindly post it in the group as individual slides I would like to use this to okay. uh, educate sure. my nurses. Sure. Thank sure. you very much. No problem. I appreciate we'll that. We'll we'll it's a wonderful we'll presentation. Thank, Thank you, you sir. Thank you, sir. So moving uh, forward, so another three questions are here. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. One is role of plasma transfusion in NEC. Role of plasma transfusion. FFP. FFP. Is that FFP. It? Uh, that is a difficult, uh, difficult one. Uh, why would you use FFP in an EC? Yeah, I hmm? think they are asking because the, the if it, if it is a very severe and the stage three NEC with the thrombocytopenia with the uh, tinge of sepsis. So maybe that's mm -hmm. why the coagulation but, is but, pretty but, but, but Junaid, that is the treatment of uh, not NEC, but the, uh, but exactly. shock or uh, complication uh, of hemodynamic uh, yeah, issues. DIC, actually, coagulation DIC, and it, all those. Yes, yes so, it is not a treatment of NEC. It is a, com no, a treatment no. with complications. Right, so with the complications. Yeah, that's the thing. Yes. Another question from Dr. Makbul Kadir, sir. Uh, if the yes. definition is not universally acceptable, then how we how can we trust uh, the beta analysis from the different units with different defi definitions? Quite a uh, big problem, uh, Mahmoud. Uh, as usual, you have to do the uh, throw a spanner in the, into things. Yes, of course, it is very difficult, and that is the reason why comparative studies, as far as NEC is concerned, is extremely difficult. Because if we can't define something, then how do we compare with each other? So uh, if somebody is calling an apple, uh, an orange, uh, the same, it can't be the same. So yes, you're absolutely right. That there's a huge issue uh, about the uh, definition and you can only compare if people are using the same definition at that time. So uh, you really have to just uh, uh, take it at that. That is how it is. The, the, there is no uh, unified consensus, consensus, con census definition of NEC. Yeah. Right, sir. So another question is sir, from uh, Dr. Aisha Rafiq. Uh, she's asking, uh, sir, I have a question from uh, Dr. Aisha from yes. CMA Lahore. Uh, we have a baby with 35 plus 5 weeks. Yes. With history of prom for 20 days. Initially treated for uh, 
the doctor of my early onset neonatal sepsis for two days and antibiotic stopped as uh, culture was normal vitally stable on fifth day of life he developed abdominal distension and aspirate with raised crp of 123 uh and cbc shows uh sorry gas shows minus 7 base deficit and he was on uh, express breast milk and feeding started at uh, day first postnatal life x ray abdomen shows uh, showing dilated gut loops should we label it nec not just yet <laughs> yeah if you if you have abdominal distension and distended loops uh, uh with a history of prom that's much more likely uh, much more likely to be a baby who who has in sepsis rather than nec and i i know the culture was negative but you have a very high crp now crp rises in uh, in nec uh, and it can be very high the question is uh, i i personally would i don't know what junaid thinks but i think that that baby is much more likely to have se- sepsis rather than nec